Hello and welcome to this workshop on the European pillar of social rights. We're talking about how to make social policies fit for the future. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Of course, we have interpretation as we have all through the event in English, French and German. You will also see sign language online if you're watching or on the big screen and we have subtitles as well. We're going to use the Slido tool, as you can see there on the big screen. You can scan that QR code, or you can go to slido.com and put in the code for our event, which is EESRF2023. And do make sure to choose the workshop on the pillar of social rights so that we get your questions for our fantastic speakers who will be able, hopefully, to answer as many as possible in the next hour and a half. Um, of course, there is also a chat online for those of you joining online. You can share technical questions there and you can interact, but do please use the Q&A function, the Slido function, for our questions for our panelists. So, the European pillar of social rights is not just a concept, it is a lifeline in today's tumultuous socio-economic landscape. With households grappling with cost of living crisis, trying to make ends meet, the EU is facing a whirlwind of structural challenges, demographic shifts, the green and digital transitions, skill shortages, unconventional work patterns, and the enduring spectre of poverty. So we're going to try and tackle all of those. I'm going to set the scene just a little bit before we delve into questions for you, the audience, as well as for our panelists. My name is Jennifer Baker. I'm an EU policy journalist based here in Brussels. And what we're going to talk about is, as I said, those mega trends. Demographic change and the consequences for the labour market and social protection systems are huge. The size of Europe's working age population is expected to shrink from 64% in 2019 to 56% in 2070. And every year until 2050, the EU working age population is expected to fall by 1 million people. The overall fertility rate has also been falling as well in the EU from 2.4 in 1970 to 1 1.5 in 2020. And the number of people aged 75 plus is expected to rise. You know, that's a great thing if you are approaching 75 to feel that you've got a good number of years left in you, and that's because of better health care and so on. But it does mean that there is increasing demand for pensions and also for long-term care with, alongside it, that shrinking labour force. Um, with under 6% in unemployment, um, unemployment is at a historical low in the EU, um, and still labour shortages are at an all-time high. Three quarters of companies in the EU have reported difficulties in finding workers with the right skills. We had a workshop on that earlier today. Only 35% of adults, according to a 2016 survey, undertake training on a regular basis. So this lifelong learning that we want to see is not necessarily happening at the level it needs to. 16.5% of the 20 to 34 year olds were neither in employment nor in education or training in 2021. Poverty and social exclusion I mentioned already, but it is also a huge issue. In 2022, 95.3 million people in the EU were at risk of poverty or social inclusion, uh, or social exclusion rather. Um, this is equivalent to 21.6% of the population, and we feel that we we're a very wealthy, well-protected part of the world, so those figures are a bit of a scandal. 9% uh, of workers were at risk of poverty in 2021. Energy poverty, something we've been talking about over the last 12 months, has also increased, and it's estimated that nearly 30.5 million people in the EU, that's 6.9% of the population, could not afford to keep their homes adequately warm in 2021. Um, the twin transitions that we're talking about always, the green and digital transitions, um, could create between one and 2.5 million additional jobs in the EU by 2030, um, depending on the speed, including almost half a million jobs in net zero clean tech industries like solar energy. The poorer half of the European population emits in 2019 um, less than three tons of CO2 per capita per year, whereas the top 10% emits 40 tons, so 10 times more. It's a huge, huge discrepancy between the different groups. And in the next five years, technological advancement will be one of the key contributing factors, creating 69 million, but also destroying, possibly, 83 million jobs. That's according to various sources. Finally, 
around 70% of all fiscal revenue is used for the welfare state, not including education. Fiscal revenue of the EU27 was at 6.1 trillion in 2021, making up just over 40% of the GDP. And around 30% of GDP is spent in social protection expenditures um, across a large variety of member states. The two biggest spending categories are pensions and healthcare. Uh, so these are going to be increasing areas in going towards 2030 and further on towards 2070. The lower end of the scale is family benefits, disability allowance, social assistance and unemployment. So there's a lot there that we're trying to keep track of. Um, our speakers here know a lot about all of these. So um, let me introduce, starting from the far end, Agnieszka Juan Dominczak, Vice Rector for Research and Director of the Institute of Statistics and Demography at SGH Warsaw School of Economics. Good afternoon. Kenneth Nelson is Professor of Social Policy at the University of Oxford. Tanya Christova is Mayor of the Gabovo Municipality and a member of the Committee of the Regions, the European Committee of the Regions, based here in Brussels. Yeah. And Gerrit van der Mosselaar is the Social Affairs Advisor to Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Health and Social Affairs here in Belgium, uh, Frank van den Broek. Thank you all so much. To get everybody warmed up, we're going to start with a poll on Slido. So uh, get out your smartphones, scan the QR code, or just go to slido.com and put in the code EESRF2023. We are asking you, which megatrend do you think will have the biggest impact on our welfare state and social protection systems? Uh, you've got a lot of options there. You've got demographic changes, the changing world of work, digitalization and technological change, climate change and the green transition, or geopolitical developments. So, fingers on buzzers, please vote for your favorite there. But I'm going to start um, by asking our panelists, which one of those megatrends would you have voted for, Agnieszka? No, I'm a demographer, so I would, of course, vote for the demographic change. But I think it is important to take all of them into account. Kenneth? I mean, all of them is a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I, would, I think I also would go for demographic changes because it's, it's going to affect our countries and we haven't seen the end of population aging for, I think we're going to peak like in 40 years from now or something. Yeah. Tanya? Coming from a municipality that is seriously affected by the demographic changes and negative demographic trends, I cannot go differently <laughs> so the demographic change will affect the whole other issues and i think we have to be very on time with addressing this and garrett yeah about the demographic changes i agree but nevertheless i think about digitalization and technical mm. change we don't know yet all the impact or the possibilities so well, we're a very, very balanced panel, everyone's <laughs> saying the same thing. And indeed, agreeing with uh, the audience vote there as well, 38% uh, say demographic changes are the biggest, biggest mega trend to watch out for. And geopolitical developments and climate change, both on the lower end, and even as the voting continues and it's changing uh, the percentages, those have both been very much on the lower end. Changing world of work and digitalization and technological change. I think probably those are quite linked, so it's not surprising to see similar sorts of voting for both of those. So thank you very much. Uh, we will be coming back to you with more polls and questions during the panel. But uh, Agnieszka, let me start first of all um, by asking you, how can we adapt our welfare state and social protection systems to cope with these megatrends, not just demographic changes, but all of them? Yes, we need to really think about uh, not only what happens to people that achieve a certain stage of their life when they need welfare support, such, for example, pensions, but have more of a life course approach. And this is also something that we have promoted in the, and highlighted in the report of the high level group on the future of the welfare state and social uh, protection in Europe. Uh, so that means that uh, we need first to invest in developing human capital. As you have mentioned, very few adult people really learn when they are adults, but we also need to think how to develop skills amongst the young people I mean, that start their education mm -hmm. even in the, you know, in, the, in the very early stages. Then we need to think about how to keep people engaged on the labor market, because when they work, they of course uh, develop themselves, they keep their skills, they, they develop new skills, but they also pay taxes and social security contributions. And at the end of the day, we really need to have this balance between uh, what is paid and what is uh, 
then transferred in a form of different kinds of either cash transfers or healthcare. We need to invest in health of people. That also includes prevention and keeping them healthy and as long as possible with all the kind of uh, mechanisms that are there, including healthy lifestyles and, and, and others. Uh, so it's a lot of different activities. So in a nutshell, we basically need to keep people active as long as they can, find ways to mobilize the potential that is currently untapped. So we, during the previous session, we discussed the issue of, uh, uh, for example, women that very frequently struggle with uh, reconciling work and family lives and care obligations. We also observe more and more that, there, that there's a, also a conflict of care amongst women that are in their, let's say, 50s or 60s because they need to care of their older parents. Mm -hmm. And this also affects their possibility of being more active on the labor market. And uh, if people work longer, automatically, there's that they claim their benefits later. So this is another thing which is important, you know, how to prolong working lives, how to postpone effective retirement ages that will enable also pension systems that are the bulk of what we see in social protection expenditure to be more or less balanced. So uh, the solutions are more or less the same. The question is how to deliver them, which is the most important challenge that is ahead of uh, well, Europe and its social protection systems. Kenneth, um, Agnieszka has outlined a lot of the, the challenges. Uh, give us a quick fix, please. How do we, <laughs> how do we uh, you know, fix any of these megatrends? Or is there any low-hanging fruit? Yeah, well, um, so basically, what, although I think the, the demographic changes are probably the most profound mega trend that we need to adjust to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm rather going to talk about the green transition, because what, what I've been doing recently in terms of research is that I'm trying to look at uh, what a sort of an environmentally friendly welfare state would look like, right? So, so I want to say a few words about that. I will come to the quick fix soon. <laughs> so, uh, but first I want to say that, that it, it's quite recognized today that, that many of the policy instruments that we increasingly need to implement to reduce our carbon footprint will lead to higher costs for households. Uh, some of these measures, for example, carbon taxes on, on, on um, energy or, or fuel uh, do also tend to have very regressive distributed profiles. So they weigh basically more heavily on the poor. And there is, there is quite a widespread recognition, both in academia and among policymakers, that in this green transition and our way towards a climate neutral society, that will require some specific compen compensatory actions for households, especially for groups that already are economically disadvantaged. And this has been raised by the OECD. I think they talked about these compensatory measures already 20 years ago. And I think, I think this summer, towards the end of the summer, I think the, the European, uh, the president of the European Parliament also raised uh, similar ideas. I would say that I'm, I'm not particularly fond of, of, of this approach to, to uh, implement new types of compensatory measures to ta tackle injustices related to the cost of climate mitigation policies, right? So, I'm gonna come to the quick fix. I, I don't believe in quick fixes. I've never <laughs> believed in them. I don't believe in them now, and I don't believe in them in relation to uh, the distributive consequences of, of or climate change and climate policies. And one reason is that these types of ad hoc interventions are typically very sensitive to changes. They tend to become less generous over time, if not completely abolished within a few years, right? Uh, in some cases, we saw that with some of the measures introduced recently with the, with the energy crisis, that some of these sort of targeted measures may also be counterproductive because they don't give the right incentives for, for um, changing our consumption in a much more uh, climate neutral direction. So, 
and now I'll come to, to, to my sort of last thing here, is that what I think is that during major social transformations, like we have with the climate change at the moment, citizens often require political stability and clear visions for the future, right? But instead of stability, what I see in many of the European countries at the moment is, is, is that the emerging risk that households rather will have to sort of rely on the whims and, and goodwill of elected officials to temporarily compensate for the distributive consequences of climate change. And I think, in the end, what this will do is that basically, basically will require by governments constant intervention to basically extinguish temporary fires, which I think will divert uh, attention for the more long-term uh, ambition to, to reach climate neutrality by 2050. So essentially what, what I'm saying is that there are no quick fixes, or at least I can't see them. And, but I see also that many European governments trying to implement these uh, uh, quick fixes by introducing temporary compensatory measures, which I think in the end is the wrong way to go. I will talk more about that later on. Thank right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Tanya, how crucial is the role of the, um, the regional areas? I mean, regional and local levels must work together to bolster the, the policies that we want to see mitigating the, uh, the impact of the twin transition. So how do we do that? How, how, tell, explain to us how those different layers of, of governance work, particularly concerning employment and social dynamics. I think that in order to succeed in this twin transition, we have to work not only on local and regional level, but we also have to have the national and European level in line in this endeavor, because otherwise the success of what is think at the top of um, the pyramid will not affect and will not reach the people that are to be engaged with these very important policies and also to create not only good opportunities but also new uh, chances for sustainability. So when we talk about local and regional authorities and because I'm coming from uh, local authority municipality in Bulgaria and I'm also engaged with the committee of the regions where we are working on different different um, uh, issues related uh, to our um, citizens and um, the opportunities for them. I have to say that the role of local and regional authorities is really pivotal and this could be easily understood by the fact that we are the areas where all the polities affect directly our citizens and their responses are really proving the positive and also the negative part of the implementation, which is something very important when it is um, coming to discuss this very important transition. And if we look at the profile of the regional and local authorities, we will acknowledge that we have the apprehension of all employment scenarios, of what are the social dynamics, and also the environmental challenges that are specific to all our communities. And in this way, with this knowledge, we can create policies and we can can create tools that will resonate and will be much more effective with the people and in this way will ensure the relevance and the efficiency of these policies. Actually, the local and regional authorities could be really a laboratory of innovation and they can test projects that if finally proven to be successful in testing different approaches related to green um, and digital transition, then they will definitely contribute to the uh, European uh, aspect of these endeavors. And I think the majority of European municipalities and regions are very engaged in working for uh, undergoing together with its citizens in this twin transition. And uh, something that is very important for us, uh, which we are very close to the citizens, 
is proven even by the reactions that we have with the COVID crisis. We were the first on the frontier and we were the first to organize and to mobilize and to react directly to the needs of the citizens. Therefore, in this uh, endeavors, we are really very close to the needs of our citizens, of their uh, threats and also of their opportunities. And something which is very important uh, in this regard is the way we at local level work together, together with all partners. We apply the so-called quadruple helix approach and I'm very happy that we have people from academic and uh, uh, university aspects because we need evidence-based policies in order to convince our citizens that something is good and that something is going to work. And here I will mention very concrete policies, like the housing one, like um, the need to um, change and to enrich our skills in order not to be left outside the labor market because of the uh, changing trends thanks to the green and digital transition. And we are working very closely with uh, different type of organizations which allow us to test and implement different tools which are with enriched resource. And I will just add two things which, because I'm coming out from local elections and I had the chance to feel the energy of the citizens and we uh, actually have to acknowledge or to confess that we owe them a lot because we need to provide them with predictability, with uh, awareness that they are supported and they are supported at local, regional, national and European level and that there is a consideration for uh, all of their challenges to be addressed and to be provided with uh, proper um, uh, tools. And um, here I would also uh, like to say that one of the things that I realized as a crucial for the implementation of a green and digital um, transition is to work for more responsible and better political stability and predictability because nevertheless how good is an idea or a reform it should be delivered and demonstrated in such a way that will really affect the citizens, something which sometimes is um, deprived by the extremism of the populism that is spreading around. And I will finish with the fact that the local and regional authorities are not only important for mitigating the threats of the dual transition, but we are also the uh, resources through which we can collaborate with our citizens, we can foster on innovation and collaboration, and, be, we'll be, and we are really indispensable uh, actors in ensuring that this transition will have also the impact of sustainability, will be fair and equitable, and also will really care for the inclusivity. Thank you. Um, interesting that you're coming straight out of elections and you've got that insight. Garrett, let me ask you, it's sort of related, what should be the role of national protection, social protection systems in an environment where challenges are increasingly global? Um, national context seems to be absolutely key to design effective policies, to really hear from people but a lot of the big trends we see happen beyond our borders. Yes, indeed, and I think the recent has history with, uh, with all the shocks we, we have been facing, um, we have seen that um, the importance of, of, of welfare states, and uh, we, are see, we are looking to the national social protection system to have a stabilization, uh, to have solutions, to come up with policy responses on the trends, but also on the shocks. Uh, and I think there is a big responsibility for uh, national policymakers, but also regional and local policymakers to come up with uh, uh, policy responses and to organize indeed uh, solidarity between EU citizens. Um, and 
with um, the knowledge of specificities of the local or regional level or the national level, uh, to have a design that is fit for the EU citizens to be inclusive, to be sustainable. And so there is a, a big responsibility, I think, for the uh, national social protection systems, uh, because we rely, I think, uh, as been shown in the, during the crises, uh, on the stabilization capacity of these systems. Um, they are there to, to support our citizens uh, and to, 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 to put into the center the, the human, uh, the well-being of the human, and to have uh, a sustainable solutions also to the, to the profit of the, the economy uh, within the European economy, Economic Union. So that's an in interesting uh, I would say experience also with the background of uh, trends as global trends um, to, to design policies that are indeed fit for future. Uh, and coming back indeed to the, to the title of the, of, the, of the workshop, indeed we have the European pillar with the, the nice 20 principles and the pillar gave us indeed also the provision uh, of the access to social security, so there is indeed a responsibility to act on uh, social security and national social protection systems needs to be adapted and updated, um, taking into account these challenges, these global challenges, uh, to give responses to EU citizens. Um, it's a buffer. National social protection systems function as a buffer, also towards the minimum uh, schemes. So we have to think profoundly on how to change them to be able indeed to have their function of stabilization and, and buffer towards minimum safety nets. And I think I can summarize in, indeed also my colleagues and, and, and I would rephrase the sustainability, sustainability uh, slogan that has been well known, it's, it's being um, Think global, act local, but I would uh, add just something. Think global, prepare European, and act local. Well, thank you. That's, <laughs> a, that's something we can all <laughs> probably sign up to. Um, Agnieszka, let's be real about um, the pressures on, uh, on, making, on, on developing these uh, welfare and employment policies. A euro can only be spent once, unfortunately. So how can the EU and member states react to the conflicting priorities um, and, and, you know, I guess stretch the resources, but how do you balance that in terms of a hierarchy? Well, it is a difficult question because, I mean, first of all, when we have different uh, kinds of crises and shocks, there is, of course, an immediate reaction that we need to spend money to sort of create a buffer or to release the pressure at least for a, or for a while and we sometimes forget about these long-term changes like the demographic change. The fact that the demography will change was known two decades ago and three decades ago, so that's nothing new. But the issue is that it, it gradually comes and finally we see that and we see those figures of you know the European working population declining by one million every single year, that's, that's a big city, mm. basically speaking. Every single year we lose a big city in Europe. So, um, as I have mentioned, it is very important to first think when we can mobilize potential instead of spending money. So, again, mobilizing those that potentially can work instead of providing them with transfers, but also um, thinking about the balance between generations with population aging, uh, there will be a lot of pressure to spend more towards older people. That's what we see in social protection expenditure, that it is very much biased towards the old. So one of the recommendations that we have, for example, in, in the high-level group report is that we should have some kind of a golden rule to think about social investment. So the kind of social spending that is not, uh, that is an investment. If we invest in early childhood education at care, this is something that will bring returns, but it also brings uh, jobs and it also brings potential to reconcile work and family lives. For example, once I, I recently read a report in Poland and uh, you know, some uh, information from one of the mayors of the smaller cities in Poland that said that you know once we created an ECEC facility, early childhood and care facility, uh, there are more young people that stay in our city, that find jobs because they know that they have care and because of that they decided to stay and work and you know, have a better life. So it is important to really find a balance and to really think 
where we have to provide investment, when we have to spend towards welfare, but also how can we prevent certain kind of uh, development that lead to the higher pressure of expenditure, when we can, where we can do that. So uh, not only thinking about you know, conflicting spending, but how to think long term, not to spend that much and gain where we, where we can gain. So this is the only way we can do that. Kenneth, coming uh, back to environmental sustainability, which you're looking at, how can EU social policies contribute to addressing the challenges of climate change? <coughs> yeah, I, I don't know really, but, <laughs> but uh, it's basically a question that uh, <coughs> interests me at the moment. And, and basically, you know, how, how can we use the existing social policies in the EU to increase the possibilities of implementing necessary but unpopular mm. climate policies, right? Uh, so referring back to what, what, what I previously talked about, so my, my recommendation would be that we, or my hunch is that we may not necessarily uh, need to reinvent the wheel with various types of targeted interventions that may or may not survive to the next election period, right? Uh, so what we instead need to do, I think, is basically to ensure that the social protection system that we already have in Europe, in European countries, uh, provide adequate protection against income losses during certain critical life stages or life events like uh, unemployment, long-term illness, and so forth. Because I think that in combination with, with the labor market, where we basically have crowded out the lowest paid jobs, I think that climate, in, in a context like that, I think that climate mitigation policies may not necessarily become such a financial threat to people. And hopefully this will also give the politicians a greater leeway in order to step up the, the climate ambitions uh, uh, that they already have uh, agreed upon. So that, that would be my, my sort of hunch uh, that try to avoid these temporary target panic related interventions <laughs> and rather go back to the traditional type of social protection uh, that we have had in Europe for many, many decades, but which have become pretty, pretty eroded uh, over the last two decades or so. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned unpopular measures because I think we'll probably come back to talking about voters and what people will vote for because uh, that obviously in a democratic society has to be considered and that will also change over time as well um, when we see an aging population. Tanya, you talked about, um, we talked about local and regional authorities um, and what they do on the ground, but how can they also give feedback to policies at EU level? Well, I think that Europe can learn a lot from local and regional authorities. And again, because the local and regional authorities are really every day together with the citizens and they can feel both the positive and the negative uh, things that happen on the ground. And this could be uh, something that together with uh, higher institutions could be transformed into actions that will constantly evolve and improve the social policy. Because sometimes it is good to be revolutionary, but I think sometimes it's better to have simply evolution. And I know that we react more adequately when we have crisis, or at least I can speak from my experience. But I don't think that it is really truly healthy in the long term, especially when it comes to social impact through the green and digital transitions. And of course, on local and regional level, what we can do at first is to engage with strong social policies that will be delivered on the ground. And of course, to take into consideration the European pillar of social rights, because this is our common objectives, and these are our um, opportunity to work 
together. And by mentioning together, I would like to mention also that um, local and regional levels work in different networks, they participate in different organizations. I myself am privileged to be part of the European Committee of the Regions where we discussed so much about uh, different policies, including the social, which is um, really very important and it is part of the fabric of the European uh, unit. So, union. So, by being together in different um, uh, collaboration, we not only share experience learned from each other, but we also collaborate on common challenges. And this could also be very enriching for the EU policy making, learning from our on the ground experiences and from our on the ground insight. I will repeat that we have to be every day creative and innovative and in order to be successful through innovative approaches we can test pilot projects and in this way try to monitor adjust and adapt different opportunities that then could also be fit in the european policies and will finally uh, bring benefits to the citizens, to the companies. Once again, I will mention that data is very important and we on local level could be very useful because we can collect and provide useful information which could be not only qualitative but could be accompanied by quality uh, measurements and of course we are obliged to work for promoting social inclusion and equity this is something that will be very high on our agenda and it is high in of our agendas because we must on local and regional level continue enhancing our efforts and I believe that uh, all the uh, available tools and programs will um, uh, also improve in quality and will help us to address poverty issues, will help, help us to address educational disparities and also healthcare access. And in this way, we can really uh, work for social fairness and um, contributes to the aspect of inclusivity. And also something very important and something very pragmatic on local and regional level, we can be very much engaged with awareness raising campaigns because we have to invest more in teaching our citizens about the social policy of Europe and about their concrete social rights. I think we need to do more in this direction. And by doing this, we can increase the public engagement and also the support that is essential for the success of uh, the implementation of um, uh, any, uh, any policy. And of course, uh, I've mentioned that it is good to have um, data collection, but we also have to uh, invest in uh, good monitoring and also uh, evaluation of what we have been doing and what could be uh, also improved. And because I'm coming uh, from a country like Bulgaria, where the cohesion policy is really very instrumental, I have to say that we have to invest more in uh, producing synergy between our local budgets and the European budgets, and thus uniting them with the common goal to achieve um, social achievements. And through the cohesion policy and also through all the European funds, we can have very good resources to engage our citizens and to deliver concrete opportunities for them in different aspects. Nevertheless, whether we are addressing minorities or um, long un the un unemployed citizens or elderly people which actually are not so old but they are quite qualified and they could be a real resource 
for us. I'm speaking on behalf of the public authority that is in big demand, for example, for engineers. And it is not so easy to attract them after graduating universities. And I will mention something that goes uh, to the point that I started um, um, about uh, networking and working together. Uh, we at the Committee of the Regions had a, a, an opinion on the European Pillar of Social Rights, which we have drafted recently. And through this opinion, we embarked on the significant endeavor to boast regional and local involvement in the implementation of the Pillar's action plan. In this way, aiming to ensure that the social policies and the principles outlined in the PIOR are really effectively integrated and applied at all levels of governments. And in this opinion, uh, it is underscored how important it is to focus on localized approaches to social challenges and also to tailor solutions that reflect the unique needs of uh, our citizens and also provide for opportunities uh, for them. And this is uh, an opportunity that is uh, applicable across Europe. And I think with this, I have mentioned quite enough opportunities through which we uh, as local politicians together with our partners can really contribute to the success of the social policies and to make the twin transition a real success. Of course, with many difficulties that should be overcome on that journey. Well, thank you. And speaking of success stories, Garrett, I was going to ask you to share a recent reform implemented at national level to make the welfare system fit for the future. Yeah, I can give two examples so quickly indeed on, on how we try to indeed have a sustainable social protection system in Belgium and how we try to contribute to, um, to the European pillar also uh, in that regard. So we introduced a, a, a big mind shift in our incapacity benefit system uh, for people who are long -term in, in long-term incapacity. Uh, we, we introduced a multidisciplinary approach, I would say, with shared responsibilities and, and some of the characteristics Sticks of this policy is indeed that we try now uh, to reach out really uh, quick to people uh, falling into long-term incapacity to, to see with them how they can reintroduce into the labor market. We know that we have a, an objective of uh, employment rates within the European Union, and in Belgium we have more than 500,000 people that are in long-term incapacity. So there is a, a big potential, I would say, to see how we can introduce these people again in the labor market. So we, we had 100, 100 uh, return to work coordinators, it's called, within the sickness funds, which, uh, who are responsible to reach out to these people and to try uh, to see where are the possibilities within the labor market, maybe not with their previous employment, but maybe also elsewhere. So there is indeed um, a mind shift ongoing, also within uh, the doctors, because yeah, doctors prescribe indeed your incapacity uh, for work or not. There is no in-between, so we try to see also have a, um, a mind shift within the doctors that they can see together with their patients trajectories returning to work. So that's, uh, that's, that's one example, also with incentives for employers to uh, create opportunities for people in long-term incapacity to go back to work. So there is a multidisciplinary approach to have indeed uh, uh, active labor market part uh, participation for the most uh, of our people. Uh, and another uh, example quickly is indeed um, um, we call it the working in the artists, uh, working in the arts project, and there we launched indeed uh, following the artist status, uh, who are people often with uh, precarious employment periods, so they are not always active. They are preparing uh, uh, cultural performances, uh, and there we created some kind of all areas path towards social security. Um, before artists or cultural workers within Belgium had to prove towards every institution what they were doing, uh, if it was artist work, when they were performing, and if it 
gave entitlements into social security. Here we created an all areas pass, I would say, for social security and for culture workers. So they get the recognition and it uh, allows them to, without administrative burden, to have access uh, to social security and to have better benefits and better benefits also on the long term because they don't have to prove uh, all the time when they are active. We, uh, recognize also that there is a preparatory uh, work to the cultural uh, performance. So in that regard, we try to have um, more sustainable social security for the cultural workers. Well, thank you, and that's that's good to hear. It's um, you know it's a quite a unique sector to work in. Um, I see we've got some questions already coming in via Slido for our panel. Um, I'll take the first one that I saw, which is, what are the panel's thoughts on universal basic income? Is it just a pipe dream? Um, who would like to tackle that first? Perhaps, Kenneth, what do you think of universal basic income? Uh, <clears throat> I can act like an economist now and answer this question. Is it just a pipe dream? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, I'm not a strong believer in basic income, and, and, and the reason why I'm not a big believer in it is that in countries where, where uh, we don't really have universal basic income, but we have quite long-standing experience, if we look at all the welfare state, especially the liberal ones, of uh, providing sort of more universal flat rate benefits, which is based on a little bit of a similar idea. And it basically every time turns out in practice that th those benefits hardly reach up, high up the income scale. So they're basically, it's a very ineffective way of reducing uh, inequalities and problems of poverty, in my mind. But I know that there are a lot of believers in basic income up, out there, but usually they come from uh, political philosophy and, and areas like that rather than uh, sociology and econ economics. That I would guess. be my take on it. <laughs> I'm an economist as well as a demographer, so you know, I think I share also the same concerns. And the second thing is there's, there's certain path dependency that we also need to take into account. We have our welfare systems that have been built over years and in different ways they, in a better or, or a worse way, cater for those that need support and help. And I think uh, in many countries, those that really need help have this help provided. And if the universal basic income can also create a lot of inefficiencies that were partially mentioned by Ken. So I, I would say that I would be very cautious. Tanya, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't believe in universal bas basic income, to be fair because I think that we have to remain competitive. We have to care for the people to be supported, to be active on the labor market. We have to provide different support and opportunities. But I'm afraid that we cannot design such a good universal solution that fit all the needs and all the territories. So I think maybe in a century, this could be a topic that could be considered as implementable. But at the moment, I think we have other type of challenges that we definitely have to address. And most of us won't be here in a century to discuss <laughs> it. Uh, Garrett, you chime yeah. with the others? Yeah, I share the ideas indeed, and, and we have to keep in mind the insurance principle of our welfare system or our social protection system. So, and, and there we, we try to organize solidarity, um, and, and solidarity is also about cohesion, so we have to be aware uh, that there is a, a lot of, yeah, I, I would say, uh, legitimate doubts on, on how we can guarantee this kind of, of cohesion or, or insurance-based uh, uh, protection systems when we, when we would introduce such a universal basic income. Um, another question from our audience. What role for synergies between social protection, social rights and health systems role to promote good health, equity and well-being? Um, Tanya, perhaps you could have a look at that. You were talking about synergies earlier um, between different, different parts of the welfare system, but what about specifically the health system's role to promote well-being? I think when we speak about uh, addressing 
challenges in general, nevertheless social or environmental or employment, we cannot go only for one component or for one segment. We have to have holistic approach and to encourage systematic ecosystem thinking. So I think that in order to have all these issues in a good quality, you cannot just go for one of them. So we have to learn to think and to work in a new way when we are not focused on a single component, but with the whole holistic approaches available or new that could be designed to address all these issues. And probably many reforms here could contribute to this to happen. And something that I forgot to mention, and uh, again it comes from my local experience, is that sometimes citizens and people on a local and regional level suffer due to the fact that we need more decentralization. Because we, when we have more instruments and more opportunities on a local level, then we will take care of the better quality also for these um, components that are part of this question. Um, let me see, um, Agnieszka, did you want to weigh in on this question as well? Um, Yes, and can too, I believe. And uh, I think there's uh, one thing that is common for all, the, all of those systems, and this is actually coming uh, just uh, like a proverb from, from health system. It's better prevent than to cure. So we really need to think about the synergies in the social protection, health systems, and also social rights to, to prevent situations when people are, are at different kinds of risks, be it health, health risks, uh, social exclu exclusion risks, inactivity risks, and so on. So an example that was given uh, by Gareth on, on the early intervention in order not to fall into inactivity because of uh, disability or long-term illness is a very good example. So we really need to think how to prevent and how to help people uh, act and, and react in, at the early stages of a potential risk so that they do not fall into illness, into a long-term unemployment, into inactivity, into poverty, into different kinds of risks that lead to the social exclusion. And, and if we do it like that, and social rights, and the pillar of social rights also has this kind of preventive measures, when we really read it carefully, it is very important that we act that way. Kenneth, sorry, did you want to also? Yeah, I, I'm, this is a very interesting question. So, so and I also done done some research on it. So, uh, I think the first thing thing to 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 note here is that if we want to sort of if we think about good population health or 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 or, or <coughs> health inequalities are very very seldom explained by how countries have organized the healthcare system. They are rather explained by the social determinants of health. That's usually what the epidemiologists talk about. And the healthcare system have, it's very difficult to see that the healthcare system as such may, may uh, affect those social determinants. But social protection may. So that's, I think, we have a clear link. So we should know, and, and this I actually be publishing on, so, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just speculating here. We can actually see that there is a link between population health, inequalities in health, and how countries have organized their cash benefits, right? So an unemployment benefit not only reduce poverty and may reduce income inequalities, it also have health effects. So I think that's quite important to to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see um, a question here asking, how can we better ensure that our welfare systems do not inadvertently cause excess immigration into the union? I'll put the emphasis there on excess immigration because I don't want to give the impression that we're talking about all immigration. Um, does anyone see that as an issue? Yes, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, it's me again. Uh, uh, First, I would like to say, uh, emphasize that what you raised. So, so I think what, 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 what is characteristics 
of, of the welfare system in the European countries is that most of it is based on the social insurance principle, that is a contributory principle. That should be no problem whatsoever with immigration. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing to know. The other thing I would like to note, <coughs> I, I have very hard troubles to see that all, all the refugees that have come to, to Europe in the recent year come here because we have so good social assistance benefits. They basically come here because they, they are frightened for their life in their home country. That's what drives them here. I, I can't see that. I can't see that this is a problem, honestly. I'm going to take two questions together. Um, they're asking here, what is the future for the European pillar of social rights? What will be the wish for the next uh, Euro European Commission? And how will the Belgian presidency possibly steer it? And also, are there any gaps in social policy that could be tackled at EU level? Now, I'm going to ask all of you at the end of our panel to suggest policy areas for the Commission. We will outsource some of the work to you. But if you can answer in a general way, Garrett, what do you think the gaps are that might be tackled by uh, the next European Commission or indeed the Belgian presidency? Yeah, there, there, are, still, there are still gaps, that's clear. Um, certainly on social protection, we had a, a nice recommendation in 2019 based on principle 12 of the pillar. So we had reporting uh, from member states and a, a commission report earlier this year. And there we see indeed a room for, for further initiative. And I think um, room for further initiative, but also room for better mutual understanding what are the challenges and how to address them. Um, because indeed, we've seen about uh, on the reporting by member states that we are still indeed it's national welfare states, but the European Union and the pillar can be a levier indeed to have um, more common understanding and to guarantee the interlinkages with, between our uh, welfare member states to have standards uh, in terms of uh, access to social protection uh, and adequate social protection. So there I can I, I, it's the ambition of the, Euro, of the Belgian presidency indeed to work on that and to, uh, in close cooperation with the Commission, to see which initiatives we could take to better monitor uh, these uh, kind of uh, challenges and issues uh, at the one hand, but also to see where there is uh, room for possible initiatives. Um, we had the experience, the good experience, I would say, of sort of financial, financial solidarity with the SURE instrument, for the unemployment benefits uh, and the, the job retention schemes during the COVID crisis. Uh, a lot of member states profited from this uh, financial solid solidarity by the European Union. I don't think it was thinkable uh, some years ago that there would be such a kind of initiative. Um, and we can uh, see together uh, with the next commission how we, we could indeed, um, not reinventing the wheel, but see how we can granularly modify maybe some kind of instrument supporting welfare member states, national welfare member states. Tanya, the same question to you. Are, th are there any gaps for, for social policy at EU level and where should the, the pillar go? I mean, obviously taking into account that a lot of areas of social protection are national competencies. I mean, are there any areas that could move from a national competency to an EU level perhaps? Uh, what's your thinking? Well, Maybe first of all, we have to adapt our local and regional strategies in line with the European pillars of social rights and the action plan that reaches for 2030. And we have to, how to say, increase our motivation and activism in order to work for achieving the, the common goal that is to create a Europe that is inclusive innovative and interconnected, something that should be negotiated among all of us. And this means, in order to translate uh, the, the mission of the social peers, is that there should not be a citizen that is to be left alone or behind, or an area where these social inequalities are really uh, very, very serious. And here, Coming to the serious uh, 
uh, goals that um, the pillar of social rights and the action plan provides, we have serious engagement in uh, reaching very high percent of employment. And how could we get there with uh, almost 80%? Uh, this means that we, ha we have to probably take better opportunity of the um, uh, green uh, jobs creations because we have to address the, the challenges um, uh, in front of us. And in order to create more green job um, initiatives, we, uh, we have to be supported by proper set of tools that will help uh, our citizens, our schools and our companies to be uh, more in a harmony uh, and to address this in a proper way because otherwise the cost will be very high and those that are engaged nowadays in um, activities that will be swept by the twin transitions have to be provided for the social payments and I think it's better to invest in training, in tree skilling, in uh, transforming our educational uh, systems rather than uh, considering uh, higher expenses for social, for social payments. And of course, we have to invest very much in, um, in skills, in our education. We are not now um, in a position to uh, invest in producing probably civil engineers, but people who will be adapted to addressing the, the new challenges, the new types of uh, relations that we are going to experience. And here I will just mention the artificial intelligence, which for some of us is an opportunity and for some of us is also a serious uh, challenge. I will not mention uh, negative words like threat or uh, difficulties and I believe that artificial intelligence will be an instrument that will help human beings to solve these big challenges rather than um, human beings become slavery of that artificial intelligence. We have to, we have to insist for more measures uh, in order to overcome the poverty and the threat of uh, people to be excluded. Um, and here the local and regional authorities could be very instrumental because we can have and we have strategies how to address these issues. And here it is not only the social component, it is also the housing, it is the um, uh, employment, it is the whole um, uh, system that should be engaged in th these efforts. And here comes the importance of the uh, medium and local sized enterprises because they are very important and they should be supported and provided with proper tools so that they can be secured for proper financing in order to go through this transition and also to be uh, engaged with the social component of their development so that they will also be part of this um, um, innovative social system that will address not only getting more profits but getting more motivated people and reaching um, goals that are uh, really important for the betterness of our society. It is not only cities and metropolitans that are important, but we have the pressure of our small-sized villages, which are also an opportunity for green entrepreneurship and here proper uh, programs could be very supportive because uh, we noticed, especially in Bulgaria, through the COVID period, how many young people decided to come back mm. to buy a house and settle their business uh, um, in the nature, which is uh, an opportunity which should be supported and I'm sure that it will be very rewarding. And one of the biggest challenge especially for my country, is how to make so that all human beings, nevertheless of the age, get tuned to learning through the, throughout their lives and getting new skills and thus being able to 
uh, to be part of the economic and social systems. And I believe that we are trying to be very active in my city in this regard, working on different innovative projects, like, for example, establishing a regional innovation valley in Gavrovo, working with the university, with the businesses, and many other partners, and also creating new cultural initiatives, like, for example, creating a new center named Under Christo and Jean Claude. These projects will provide for public-private partnerships that will be with the purpose to establish new opportunities and to attract talents from across um, not only Europe, but I believe also the whole world. And by doing so, by showing uh, up how small initiatives could bring um, uh, good results, I'm sure that uh, we will manage to address the biggest challenge, how with the decreasing number of population and with the aging of our population, we have to manage to overcome these new challenges, which require better knowledge, better competencies, and I believe better common collaboration. And I think Europe is the best possible area that uh, this uh, challenge could transform into sustainable uh, opportunities. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here. I'll put them together on workplace. Um, Agnieszka, perhaps you could <laughs> tackle this one. Um, over half of all young people in the EU complete a traineeship or an internship. And how can the EU reconcile unpaid traineeships with the pillar? So I guess uh, dealing for looking at quality work. And uh, someone else, Antoine, has asked, is there a place for more workplace democracy in the pillar of social rights? Well, I think there is a plenty of place for work workplace democracy in the pillar of social rights and the right to high quality jobs and, and to stable jobs is a, is a pillar of social rights. So we definitely need to work on solutions that young people have access to good employment opportunities, that they are covered by social protection systems uh, in their jobs and they are not paying, uh, working for free. This was, by the way, something that we also discussed in the high level group with the representatives of youth organizations that basically show that it is also important for them to see the benefits of the social protection, that we shouldn't look at them as a resource to finance benefits for those that are not working anymore, the elderly, but rather trying to find a balance. That is why also I mentioned the issue of uh, social investment. And um, I think in general we also should uh, look not only at issues that were mentioned related to how uh, to have more jobs, how to provide opportunities for people to upskill and reskill, but also we need to understand the kind of uh, uh, sort of conflict that prevents people from being at work, including those to working at home. And uh, um, it was already mentioned, but I think it's important to underline that there's lots of tension between, for example, home and work responsibilities, proper sharing the, of the responsibilities at home between uh, partners is definitely one of the ways to have more opportunities for women to join uh, employment and the workforce. So we also need to look at these kind of issues that are not only on the labor market, but also in the household levels. I'm looking also at these questions, and I think it's very important to uh, counteract any kind of discrimination. Mm -hmm. There's a question whether we should, uh, uh, on, on, on gender and care responsibilities, I think it's a huge issue. Women are roughly half of the population, so that is why it is so important. But any kind of discrimination has to be really uh, taken very seriously, be it age, race, or other kinds of mm -hmm. uh, issues. Well, actually, Garrett, I'm going to ask you that question as well, um, that someone has asked. Obviously, we've mentioned the discrimination based on care responsibilities and gender. What about discrimination on these other grounds that Agnieszka is suggesting? How should we address that at EU level? Yeah, that's not, that's not an easy one, but yeah. it's an important one. And I would say also that the role of social partners or, or social dialogue model 
to, to see together indeed how we can address on a EU level, but also on a national level, these these kind of uh, discriminations or, or it's it's uh, it's uh, it's to be tackled to, to be addressed uh, commonly with all stakeholders um, because it's an important one and, and indeed it's, it underscores also uh, the importance of the well-being uh, of people uh, at the workplace uh, but also uh, the balance between private life and, and professional life so there is a, a room i think for for improvement or to see how we can uh, approach these, these challenges or address them uh, by policies and policy responses that are also supported and, and, and designed together with them, um, a bottom-up approach or a social dialogue approach that uh, foster good solutions for the, to fight these kind of discriminations. I see a question there asking, what is the biggest failing of the EU in the field of employment or social during this current mandate? Um, basing that as a, as a quite big question. Um, Kenneth, perhaps you would uh, have a go at answering that. <laughs> I don't know if I have courage enough to do that. No. Uh, I don't know about this current mandate, but, but, but I think um, to me at least being a, a, a poverty and, and, and inequality scholar, I, I, I think that the biggest failure of the EU over longer term is that we still have a fairly high, uh, a fairly big problem with, 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 with both poverty and, and inequality and it mm. seems to increase, although we also belong to a region in the world who has the, the biggest and most generous welfare states. I, I would say that to me that, that's, a, that's a really uh, big failure. But then of course I would also say the whole the breakdown, the total breakdown of, of how the EU handled the migration crisis uh, is also to me one of the perhaps major failures over the last three decades or so. But Thank you. this yes. is just me personally <laughs> speaking. Yeah, so it was a provocative question. Otherwise, whoever... I, otherwise I love the EU and the uh, <laughs> Commission and everything. Well, thank you for being brave, Kenneth. I'm not going to put everybody on the spot to answer that one. Um, there is another question, however, about uh, the working week and how we might see the relationship between the future of the welfare state and a four-day working week. Um, Agnieszka, what are your thoughts on the, the four-day working week? What might be the implications for the welfare state? Well, again, it very much depends on the productivity, which we discussed over the past two days, and mm. uh, also the use of artificial intelligence and other things. And uh, uh, if we assume that the shorter working week gives the, sum, the same kind of productivity as a longer working week, probably this is something that can be discussed. If it doesn't, uh, probably it, it shouldn't be. We already observed that, I mean, after the COVID pandemic and during the COVID pandemic, a lot of people started to work from home and initially everybody thought, no, it is a great solution and maybe we should continue that. And we see more and more employers saying that, you know, at the end of the day, we see that working from home isn't as efficient as when people work on site because, I mean, people are more focused at work. They don't have any kind of, you know, disturbances that, that you are probably very familiar with, you know. There, there's a washing machine that you have to put on there. There's a dinner or a lunch that you have to prepare. Kids are coming from school. There's a dog, so, you know, you, this, this, the, the work from home can be very interrupted. It. And the other thing is that when you interact with your colleagues at work, you also learn in a very informal way. You get experiences through, you know, chatting over the coffee or something. And this is something also very important. So uh, I think it is important to first see how changes in the way we perform work affected the. Uh, the, the outcomes, let's say, in, in, in a longer run, and, and if we are ready for shorter working week, because you know, in some countries pro probably we are more ready than in the other, and it is very important also to take this into account. Yesterday, uh, Chris Pisaridis in his 
uh, keynote said that you know Germans working four days a week are more productive than Greeks working for a very long time. So <laughs> then there's a lot of differences and we need to take them into account. Yes, Kenneth. Yes, Kenneth? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just think that th there is a little bit of a paradox here as well, I think, because we, we are talking about you know, five days a week or four days a week. Uh, but still, in, in many occupations today, it, it's, the trend has rather been the opposite. We, we need to work more than five days <laughs> per week, mm -hmm. right? So I think in ter in, instead of talking about days a week, I think we should talk about hours, uh, hours per week. And why not just try to stick with the idea that we should work 38 to 40 hours per week instead of 50 or, or, or 60, which is common in, in many occupations today. And, and once we achieve that, then maybe we, we can go for the next step. Yes, indeed. In sectors like uh, nursing or in the hospitality sector, there's, uh, there's not much downtime. Any questions from people in the room? Uh, I know we've had the provocative, rather brave ones coming via Slido, but does anyone uh, like to put their hand up to ask a question in the room? Um, we have microphones. Yes. Ah, is it working? No. Do we have another microphone, perhaps, that we can try and get to the gentleman? Ah, yeah. marvellous. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Alessandro Schalfo, working for European Social Insurance Platform. Uh, it's an umbrella organization uh, representing social security institutions in the EU. And I have a question addressing the um, equal access to social protection. Uh, we know from the ground that there is a gap in accessing social protection between standard workers and non-standard workers. Uh, by non-standard workers, I mean um, temporary contract flexi jobs, uh, part-time contracts, uh, self-employed, but as well uh, platform work that we already addressed uh, yesterday as well. And next to that reality as well, the, the new trend that we can see, especially within younger generation, which is non-studded, scary path that also Im impacting, especially, like I said, younger generation in accessing in the short and long-term social protection. So my question is for the panelists, um, how including in social policies these realities, including the new trends, within the mega trends that was uh, identified earlier during this panel. Thank you very much. Okay, who would like to put their hands up first to try and tackle that complicated question? Okay, I'm just... I can try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first, uh, everybody should be covered by the social protection. So we should agree that it is important to really think about how those people that are not covered or undercovered will be covered more. And of course, I mean, first, there's a huge role of legislation to really look if we create certain possibilities to be less covered by rules that are, seem to be more flexible, but in a way that, that, that they lead to this kind of an exclusion from social protection. The other thing which is that, I also think very important is that it's not only the, the normative issue, but also informing people about their rights. And uh, very frequently, for example, pr platform workers are also migrant workers. They are not aware of the kind of social protection rules that exist in the country, and they agree to work on the rules that are basically illegal. And uh, so this is another thing, how to access people, especially those that are at risk of undercoverage, uh, with information about their rights and what they can expect. Of course, it is not easy because we know that employers very frequently uh, are using an opportunity to pay less contributions in order to have lower coverage. And also very frequently people think it's better to have their money in their pockets rather than pay uh, social security contributions. But again, the information about why it is important to be covered by social protection and there are certain kinds of risks that we can't envisage. For example, if there is a work accident, if there is disability that appears that we can't really uh, sort of foresee, uh, that means that the social protection system kicks in and there is protection. Because very frequently we also see that later on people are so surprised that they don't have enough pension, for example, because they, they've 
paid very little or they didn't pay throughout their, 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 their lives to the social protection system. So uh, first, looking at the norms, that they are the same for everybody. Second, providing access to information. And second, building awareness why it is important to be covered by social protection. Yes, Kenneth? Could I? Yes. Yeah. I think this is a, is a really interesting question, but there's, a been, there's been quite, quite a lot of reports and research on it at, at the EU level in the last five, six years at least. I think what comes out from that, at least my take home message, is that the problem of atypical workers having access to the welfare state is different across Europe because although there are similarities in the social protection system, there are also major differences. And I'm not, I'm not saying this just because I, I'm, I'm Swedish as such, but uh, my impression from, from that research is that it's much easier, it's less of a problem access for atypical workers in the Nordic countries, for example, where you have these high you basically are built the welfare state under the principle of universalism and citizenship, right? It's more of a problem, it's my impression, in continental Europe where, where your rights are so tightly connected to your occupation. And it becomes even, to my mind, an even bigger problem in southern Europe where you have this very, very big distinction between insiders and outsiders. So, so I think the question is important, but but, but the extent to which it, it is a, a, a problem, I think, to some extent, differs across Europe because we have different models of, of providing protection. Any more questions in the room? Do I see any more hands going up? Yes, just down here. Hi, hello, my name is Iri Schwarz. I come from the European Commission. And I have a question for Professor Nelson. Uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the failures uh, of the European uh, Commission in the last years was, or the last mandate, um, was um, uh, the lack of fight of, uh, of uh, inequalities. And I was wondering what would be the uh, remedy uh, uh, that, uh, that you would suggest uh, to, uh, to address that uh, at the EU level. More taxing of the rich or more redistribution or uh, better welfare for the lower end of income distribution? Or what is, uh, uh, what is your recipe for looking at this? Thank you. All of the above. <laughs> <coughs> A very easy question. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, to me, there are two things that are really important where I think the commission fails to some extent. Uh, I've, I've been raising this on a number of occasions over many, many years. And I understand why I will come to it soon. I'm building up the story here. Uh, so I understand why the commission can't really do anything in the area, but it is a problem. So when we want to explain differences across the rich countries, the high income countries in poverty and income inequality, do you know what explains those differences when we look at social protection? It is how we have organized the contributory benefit. It has nothing to do with how we have organized means that the social assistance. What is the program that the European Commission mostly is talking about? It's the opposite. It's the means that the social assistance, right? Okay, so then I want, okay, so maybe we should concentrate and talk a little bit more about the contributory part that actually make, makes the, you know, makes 80, 90% of the redistribution that goes on in the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And I, obviously I know why, why the commission have difficulties in, in, uh, in, di in, in discussing that aspect because it relates to what I said previously. These contributory benefits and how we have organized them 
differ quite, quite extensively across Europe. So I can see the probably impossible <laughs> to, uh, at the European level, you know, uh, we do it the French way or we do it the Swedish way or, wait, hang on a little bit, we, we do it the Spanish way. Uh, uh, it's much easier with social assistance because it looks fairly similar across countries. The problem is that it hardly does anything in terms of explaining uh, the rise of inequality in many European countries, the rise of relative poverty or any differences between countries, unfortunately. It would have been great if it did, but, but it just doesn't. Thank you. Um, so, to wrap up, as we are almost at the end of our time, um, I have a question on Slido for everyone, for the audience here in the room and online. So if we can have a look at that Slido question. It is, what concrete initiative at EU level would you propose for the next mandate? Um, and a question that came in from our audience was, if you had one crazy radical idea to improve social Europe and no political obstacle, what would it be? So, be creative, get your thinking caps on, uh, propose these initiatives to, to the Commission, give them a hand. Um, and I'm going to ask my panellists as well, by way of a wrap-up, to give me their uh, one crazy, crazy or concrete initiative. I'll let you choose which one. Gerrit, you can go first. I don't know if it's crazy, but it's indeed concrete in our presidency, indeed. Uh, I would say, yeah, that's the acknowledgement of social investments within the economic governance. That's really a, a priority of our presidency to have this kind of this high level discussion on how we can link indeed um, the returns on social investments to the econo economic governance performances. So there we have a, a bold idea, I would say, and a concrete idea. Thank you. Tanya, one concrete, crazy or concise idea? <laughs> it's not an easy task to identify only one crazy solution, but I think we need to invest more in social entrepreneurship. And I think this is something very important to continue working with our citizens to be more active, more engaged and in this way to be more rewarded by what we are doing. So this is not a very concrete, but this is part of my dreams related to my place. Absolutely. Kenneth, what, uh, what dreams or aspirations would you... Yeah, I'm, lo I'm looking at the, the screen. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so why not, why not the crazy idea that would never ever happen? For a number of reasons, but wh why not? Why not? Why not export Swedish family policy to the rest of Europe? Okay, totally unbiased response there, <laughs> and Neska. Uh, last but not least, if you could uh, wave a magic yes, wand. Yes, I'm also sneaking peek out on 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 what's uh, on the screen. I definitely would say that a right for childcare for all children up to age of three, which is free and good quality. So this is also reflected there, but with specification that it's especially about the youngest children. And my dream for, that is a little bit again biased because of my country, equal retirement age for men and women, full stop. Well, thank you. I think we're seeing lots of uh, interesting and excellent ideas there. Um, we're seeing tax the rich comes up twice, why not? Ban landlords, probably not going to happen. Um, address the care crisis and put EU support to homelessness. Um, reduce the risk to employ. Um, free quality childcare, Agnieszka, as you said. Shared social security, I guess funds was probably going to be the final word in that sentence before they ran out of space. Um, youth in EU institutions, um, it was the year of youth last year, so uh, we, we saw some more of that, but perhaps we'll roll that out in future years. Universal childcare also coming up. Uh, universal basic income, which we've already discussed and has <laughs> come from all our panelists that it's not going to happen. But uh, these are the, the, the blue sky thinking that uh, we want to, uh, want to have coming in. We're going to leave that poll to run because uh, I'm sure someone from the Commission is uh, ably watching it and jotting down notes from what our audience here today thinks. So thank you all very much for your great questions and thank you so much to our panelists for tackling even the toughest of them. So please give them a warm round of applause. <laughs>